Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this lightning round, engaging students in library instruction, experimentation and innovation. My name is Erin Durham Wright. I use she, her pronouns. And this year I've been serving as the chair of the ACRL um, instruction section virtual engagement committee. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I want to thank members of the virtual engagement committee for making this event possible and to Aaliyah Price for facilitating the Zoom session. Uh, we are using the ACRL Zoom meeting room for this lightning round. So we would ask that you keep um, yourself muted throughout the presentation portion and feel free to type questions um, in the chat for the presenters. Uh, next slide. I'm excited to introduce our lightning round presenters who will be sharing instruction ideas with us today. Um, in presentation order, we have Stephanie Hillis, uh, Arts and Humanities Librarian at Miami University, Sarah Hagerman, Engagement Programming Specialist, Cynthia Keller, Learning Coordinator, Abby Lewis, STEM Engagement Librarian uh, from the University of Colorado Boulder. We also have Megan Marchese, Reference and Instruction Librarian at Farmingdale State College, and Christine Fina, Undergraduate Success Librarian at Stony Brook University. Each lightning presentation will be 10 minutes and we will have a combined Q&A at the end. You can feel free to put questions in the chat throughout the session. And if you have a specific question for one of the presenters, you can type their name or the topic um, as well as your question in the chat. And next slide. Uh, each of the presenters has shared a description and uh, additional readings and resources. So you can access that through this tiny URL, which will be forthcoming in the chat. It's a lightning round digest. Um, and then just a note that during the, the Q&A at the very end, we will be using progressive stacking to prioritize questions from those from non-dominant groups, um, according to race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, et cetera. If you so identify, please feel free to indicate with an asterisk at the start of your question. And we are excited to, to get started. Um, we, I would like to turn the, um, the time over to Stephanie Hillis, who is the first lightning round presenter. So uh, hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Hillis and I am the Arts and Humanities Librarian at Wirtz Art and Architecture Library at Miami University. My pronouns are she, her. And today I will be presenting Engaging College Students in the Library Through Serendipitous Browsing, a Creative Exploration. In this presentation, I will describe and discuss a lesson plan where students engage in serendipitous browsing by creating book spine poetry, a found poetry technique where books are arranged so their titles create a poem. While this presentation will consider the project in relation to art students, it could also be used with other disciplines like English or creative writing, as well as during library tours and orientations where the librarian wants students to engage creatively with the library and its materials. I will also add that throughout this presentation, I will be using the words browsing, information encountering, serendipity, and chance as interwoven concepts. Information encountering and browsing are used as synonyms and seen as facilitating serendipity through chance. Slide. To begin, I would like to talk about the inspiration behind the lesson plan. Throughout my career as an art librarian, I have done a lot of research into how artists seek information. Since the 1970s, studies have found time and time again that artists and art students show a marked preference for browsing the stacks or information encountering as an information seeking strategy. Much of this literature also equates information encountering with the joys of serendipity. As such, I was interested in how I could incorporate this preference into the library classroom, both as a way to engage art students and as a way to demonstrate that the library and its resources can function as a place for creative inspiration and serendipitous encounters. Moreover, after COVID closures and the reliance on digital materials, I wanted to introduce students, perhaps for the first time, to the pleasures of browsing the stacks. However, when I surveyed the library literature, I found that ideas for how I could accomplish this were few and far between. The majority of the instruction literature focuses on teaching searching, not browsing. A similar phenomenon, although to a lesser extent, is also found in information seeking models. Little mention of information encountering is found before Sandra Erdelez's 1997 article, 
information encountering. It's more than bumping into information. Since then, while information encountering is found more often in information-seeking models, searching still receives more attention. As I grappled with these thoughts, asking myself, how can I facilitate the joys of serendipitous browsing in the library classroom as a way for art students to experience the library as a place for creative inspiration, I started to think more about how chance plays a role in serendipitous browsing. I knew chance had been explored as an artistic principle by various artists and movements, and began wondering if I could somehow introduce information encountering through artistic practice. Then finally, and serendipitously, Miami University happened to be doing a major weed on its library collections. Librarians had started a group chat where we began sharing humorous and interesting titles we found on the shelves, reminding me of Nina Kachadorian and the bookspine poetry of her Sorted Books project. With this group chat, my ideas began gelling into something cohesive. Slide. First, a bit about Nina Kachadorian's Sorted Books project. Since 1993, Katja Dorian has been going into libraries and creating bookspine poems by, in her words, sorting through a collection of books, pulling particular titles, and eventually grouping the books into clusters so that the titles can be read in sequence. These books are then photographed. For my lesson plan, I would have students mimic Katja Dorian's process. After introducing them to the Sorted Books product in a short PowerPoint, students would be sent to the stacks to browse and, through the principles of serendipity and chance, write bookspine poems based on the titles they found. Afterwards, students' poems would be displayed in the library's display area. Slide. On this slide, you see an outline for a 55-minute lesson plan. First, I explain the activity and introduce Nina Kachadorian. Then, students go into the stacks and create their own bookspine poems. After making their poems, students set them up for display. And then finally, students get the chance to walk around and read and discuss their classmates' poems. My learning objectives are also on this slide. At the end of this lesson, students will engage in the library as a place for artistic inspiration and creative exploration, experience browsing the stacks for serendipitous discovery, and create their own art object in the form of a bookspine poem. Since my classes are at least an hour and 20 minutes, I have been able to extend this lesson plan to include more discussion. After students read their classmates' poems, I encourage them to consider their experience browsing the stacks by asking questions like, how did you go about writing your poem? What were your thoughts? What was the experience like? What was your process? During these conversations, many students have remarked on how they didn't know what they were looking for at the beginning, but finding an interesting title sparked their creativity, giving them ideas on how they could potentially continue their poem. Locating additional titles sometimes confirmed this initial direction, but students' ideas also changed throughout the process when they came across another title that fit with the first in a way that they hadn't originally expected. Comments like this led me to conclude that my learning objectives are being met. In addition, many students have made more than one poem during the, or during the session. Slide. The lesson was first implemented in Art UNV 101, a first year experience course for students enrolled in the School of Art. I chose this class because while the professor wanted students to learn about the library, and I could see the value in this as students were first years, he didn't have a specific research assignment. I had given a more basic library introduction and tour in previous semesters, but could tell that students weren't overly engaged during the session. As noted, the lesson was a success. In fact, the lesson was successful in ways I didn't originally intend. Library patrons interpreted the, the book's fine poetry exhibition students created as part of the lesson as interactive, and patrons began creating new poems with the books in the exhibition. Thus, they too had the chance to experience serendipity and the library as a place of creative exploration. Slide. Given the success of the first iteration, the lesson was expanded to a drawing three class the following semester. After students created their bookspine poems, they chose either their poem or one of their classmates and sketched a response to the poem in class, as you see here on the slide. The papers you see on top of the poems are permission forms. The library used pictures of the poems on its social media for National Poetry Month in April. Slide. The following year, the lesson was expanded even further. 
This time, instead of sketching their responses based on either their poem or another student's poem, students created a finished drawing, their first graded assignment for the class. Here you see a student posing with the poem that inspired their drawing. Slide. Once drawings were complete, the class critique where students received feedback on their artwork from their classmates and professor was held in the library and I also participated. Drawings were then displayed alongside students' book spine poems in the library's display area for the remainder of the semester. This project was again featured on the library's social media for National Poetry Month. Labels were also created this time, listing student name and indicating which poem had inspired the drawing. Labels were also intended to discourage viewers from interacting with the exhibit and making new poems. While I had enjoyed this aspect of previous iterations, letting patrons rearrange the poems would have complicated the continuity I wanted to create between poems and their drawings. Slide. Moving forward, the professor and I expect to continue the project in future semesters. And I'm also thinking of other ways I can create opportunities for students to have serendipitous chance encounters in the stacks. The first idea is to create instructions that would ask students to go into the stacks and engage with books through chance, an idea inspired by the Fluxus artist Yoko Ono's instructions in her 1963 book, Grapefruit. For example, one instruction might be to go to the stacks and stand in the center aisle. Turn around three times. Go to the shelf you are facing and choose the 12th book on the left side. Look at the images and think about how what you see could inform your current artwork. The second idea uses a large paper fortune teller. By counting and moving the fortune teller a given number of times, patrons would be instructed to perform a particular action. For example, go to the shelf marked NA737 through NA1053 and find a book that interests you. Flip through it. Decide if you'd like to check it out. Slide. And thank you. That is all I have for you today. And I look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Hi, my name is Cynthia Keller. I'm here today with my colleagues, Abby Lewis and Sarah Hagerman. Uh, we are all coming to you from the University of Colorado Boulder. A first, thank you to the organizers for having us here today. We are excited to talk about incorporating reflective practices into our library instruction. I'm gonna start with an overview and then pass off to my colleagues for specific examples and lessons learned. Our path with this started in the spring of 2021. We are all on the same team within our organization and our team lead, Carolyn Sinkinson, started a practice of learn together meetings where we gather over Zoom to focus on a topic of interest and further our own understandings through joint study and conversation. Um, during that spring, we jointly read the book, Contemplative Practices in Higher Education. Uh, next slide, please. Reading this text, we learned about contemporary uh, contemplative practices, which are introspective and focused on the present experience. The authors provide the greater context and the intellectual history of incorporating these practices in higher ed, and then practical examples from a variety of academic disciplines. At the heart of this is the idea that we can live lives of purpose and that learning is an active process where students can find meaning. Another commonality with these practices is that students integrate their own experiences and all that they bring to their learning. Next slide. I wanna share two visuals that we found helpful. The first one is taken from a chapter in the book, Boundaries of Adult Learning. Um, here, the experience is defined as the total response of the learner to the event, what the student may think or feel or do during the situation or event and, and immediately afterwards. The reflection is the processing phase or the response of the learner to the experience. Outcomes of reflection could range from personal synthesis to a new effective state or, or some further action. I like the simplicity of this image um, and also how it shows that this is not always a consecutive process. We don't always move directly from experience to reflection and then incorporation. Next slide, please. Next, I want to share the tree of contemplative practices from the Center of Con uh, for Contemplative Mind and Society. Uh, this overall is not a new conversation. There's a rich body of literature on reflection and contemplative practices in higher education, especially over the last 30 years. Uh, so I assume that some of you may be familiar 
particularly with this image. Um, this tree of contemplative practices provides an overview of these practices that have been found of use in the classroom, shows the basic categories, and then the wide variety of practices within those categories. Uh, of course, one challenge is always putting ideas into practice. I'm gonna to pass to my colleague, Abby, uh, so she can share our take on doing so. Thanks, next slide. So we wanted to create an activity that allowed students to answer questions that prompted reflection anonymously, but also be able to see each other's responses. Padlet was a great tool for this, but there are other modalities that work well. To fit this in with our usual time limits for classes, we aimed for two to three questions that could be answered within five minutes. We also made sure to spend about five minutes discussing themes that emerged in the responses, like things that they noted causing excitement or frustration, and also answering any questions that were in the responses. Next slide. In developing questions, we looked to Franzis and Felton, who emphasized consequential validity in reflective practices. Um, this was so there would be real value to the students and what we were doing. So each question uh, aligns with one of these goals. Introspection goals have students assess their own feelings about the content or the process of their learning. Community goals prompt them to see their own position in a learning community. And disciplinary goals have them reflect on knowledge or experiences that position them for learning. Next slide. And these are some examples of questions that fit in with each of these goals. The first one is introspection, asking them to assess what makes them feel prepared. The second is community. They're thinking about other students in a uh, related context. And the last is disciplinary. What broader impact might their own learning have? And I will pass this off to my colleague, Sarah Hagerman. Hi, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So these are some more examples that um, kind of show how the disciplinary community and introspection can obviously overlap in different questions that you ask in a different context. Um, the first context right here, I think, is a great example of the disciplinary and community um, aspects of asking these questions. And it's from a class in sustainability and social innovation. And this was a one shot library instruction session that was embedded in the course curriculum. And this is kind of particularly asking them to reflect on the library session. So this is a way you could use those questions to kind of, you know, maybe low key assess your own teaching and also see how your students, you know, responded in the one shots. Um, the second example is from a course that um, it's also a one shot library instruction course, but the bigger course that it's part of is a class on um, the anthropology of the drug war and um, looking at issues of culture and power and the history of the drug war in the United States. So this one I thought was a really great example of that kind of introspection and community and also how you can really use these questions for courses that are kind of grounded in critical practices, interrogating power and asking students to kind of take what they learn into the real world. Um, and then finally, I this last example is from a freshman college kind of introduction to college course that me and my colleagues one semester taught like eight week sessions. Um, and it was taught across the campus in a bunch of different disciplines for undeclared freshmen. So I think this is a really great example of how you can kind of use that metacognitive process to um, have students kind of reflect on the process of answering the questions and also not be too attached to the answers because as you can see, there's a lot of different variety of experiences that students have. Um, next slide. And this is just a great example of how you don't necessarily have to use Padlet. You can use something as low tech as a whiteboard or post-it notes. Um, the first example on the left is um, happened after a library tour. Um, and it was a first year class library tour. So it was kind of post tour and discussion to wrap up the day and kind of reflect, you know, what would you want to share out to a friend? 
And then another model you could use is kind of building these little reflective moments in throughout sessions. So this is another tour. Um, it was part of the CU Boulder Upward Bound Bridge program over the summer. And students stopped throughout the course of the tour in the library orientation and ans answered these questions. Next slide. Um, so what did we learn from all this? Well, I think as the um, last example, a couple slides back showed, you really need to practice non enhancement to the responses. You're not really asking for feedback for assessment purposes, although that's a really nice bonus if you can get it. Um, the emphasis is really on the effective experiences of the students, and those are going to really range wildly. So just being open to the answers you receive. So in practice, it might seem like a really brief practice, but it's really important to make time for it, especially framing the exercise. You almost want to spend as much time framing the exercise as you do with like wanting to have the students answer the questions. Because it goes a lot smoother when you're sharing the purpose and goals with the students um, and you're being transparent about why you're asking the questions. Um, and this is really a great example of a metacognitive practice it can be helpful for students to take to their other classes. Um, and kind of cycling back to why Padlet's a great cool tool, that all, Padlet also allows for non-textual ways to respond. Students could put a GIF, they could put an image, they could use emojis. So make sure to offer that as an option if you're using Padlet. Um, and also emphasize that Padlet is anonymous, so students can be open without feeling like their answers are attached to their name. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you, and we'll look forward to your questions at the end. And our contact info is in the right-hand corner of the slide. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Marchese. I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Farmingdale State College. I'm going to talk about how to use an online polling program called Pear Deck to encourage student engagement in information literacy classes. Next slide. So there are a number of benefits to using polling tools when teaching. Polling can be used to check student knowledge at all different stages of the teaching process. This includes formative assessments at the beginning of a lesson and summative assessments at the end of a lesson. It's a way for the instructor to receive immediate feedback from students about their previous knowledge, to check students' comfort levels, and to see how well they're understanding concepts um, that are being taught in the lesson. Polling can be used to tailor teaching to the needs of students depending on their responses. It's a helpful way to know if you can move on from a topic or if you need to spend more time making sure everyone has a solid understanding. It also encourages student participation. Students are more likely to answer a poll question than they are to raise their hand in class. Students can also learn from each other. It can be interesting to hear everyone's different thoughts. Sometimes they bring up things that I didn't initially think about. It also might be comforting to students to know that other people in the class are also worried about their assignment or that other people might need help too. In terms of information literacy classes, we often don't know our students' names. Many of us might be teaching one-shot classes. We might not be grading them, so it can be difficult to get strong participation sometimes. There might be a handful of students who are eager to respond, but I'm interested in hearing from everyone, not just the few students who feel confident enough to raise their hands. I also want to make sure everyone has a good level of understanding. Um, we also know that active learning strategies are effective. Prompting students to answer questions and complete activities throughout the class helps them stay engaged. Next slide. Polling is also a way to provide support to students, including English learners and students with learning disabilities. Uh, this is one way for students to both hear the question and to see it written. It also provides wait time, which gives students opportunities to think and craft their responses before answering. I like using anonymous polling because I want students to feel like they can speak freely without fear of being wrong. I sometimes tell students that it's okay if you're not sure right now, give us your best guess and we're going to go over it together. I also like responses to be anonymous because I go over them with the class, I make comments and suggestions, I wouldn't want anyone to feel bad about their response. This also gives a voice to students who don't feel able to speak in class. It's nice to hear from everyone, just not the same two people who always volunteer. So these strategies can help students who benefit from extra support, but they can also be helpful to anyone. I have a master's degree in TESOL, and when I was in that program, we learned strategies that specifically target English learners. Um, we learned that those strategies are 
actually beneficial to everyone in the class. So it's not like you're only helping the English learners or you're only helping students with learning disabilities. You're using those teaching strategies that would be helpful for everyone. Um, it's also important to note that you might not be aware of who needs extra support. For example, Generation 1.5 students are students who primarily attended English speaking K-12 schools but grew up speaking a different uh, language other than English at home. Uh, these students might be proficient in conversational English, but might still face challenges with academic English. Next slide. There are a number of polling tools. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about using Pear Deck. This works directly with Google Slides and PowerPoint. You can either use pre-made Pear Deck templates to create polling prompts, or you can add questions to your existing slides. I like that it's a low investment to incorporate Pear Deck into your own presentations. It's not like you have to redo the entire presentation to use it. So once you create a Pear Deck account, you'll see a Pear Deck extension uh, with your slides. So this is what it looks like in Google Slides up at the top. Um, you would open the Pear Deck add-on and then the menu would show up on the right of your slides. So um, they have a template library with pre-made slides that you can edit. You can also add a question to your own slides. Um, next slide. So once you've selected start lesson in that Pear Deck menu, you'll see options to choose the instructor paced activity or the student paced asynchronous activity. I've been doing the instructor paced activity, which I control in class. Then a join code is displayed. I have students join at the beginning of class. Um, it's still displayed in the top corner after you start the presentation. And I also write down directions for how to join on a whiteboard for any students who walk in late, they wouldn't understand what to do. Um, I also usually use an intro slide like the one you see on the right where I link students to a Google Doc. The projector will show the slide on the left, but the student view shows both the slide and any Pear Deck content that has been added. So in this case, I link to a doc that acts as the class handout, uh, which covers the class content, um, any links like slides, the videos, databases, and citation help. Um, excuse me for one second. So I tell students to click the link at the bottom, which opens up Google Docs, and then they can make a copy and save it to their own account. Uh, next slide. So this is a sampling of Pear Deck templates that can be customized to best fit the needs of your class. Uh, you can use these to get ideas for activities and use their designs when you create your own questions. So here we're seeing some feelings check-ins, a mind map, um, some open-ended questions, and some summative assessments. Um, next slide. Um, so you can also add interactive questions to your own slides. In the red box, you can see a portion of the Pear Deck menu um, that you would see in Google Slides. You can add this interact. You can add interactive elements for open-ended text, for multiple choice, for number entry, a link to a website, and then there are also paid features to add drawing or an option to drag dots on a slide. The top example of the feelings check-in originally had that draggable feature where you could drag a dot over the person that you chose. Um, I'm using the free version, so I made it into a multiple choice question instead, and I think it still works for this option. In blue are some other examples of questions I've used. In this case, I gave students an explanation of primary and secondary sources, and then I asked them to apply that definition to the example on the bottom left. Then in a follow-up slide, I asked them why they chose their answer. And the class got to see all different types of responses that everyone gave. They got to learn from each other and rethink their own response as well. Next slide. Polling can also be used to scaffold instruction. This means to give students support when performing a task they might not yet be able to accomplish on their own. The instructor gradually fades this support as student responsibility increases. In this example, the concept that students are learning is how to develop a research topic and to identify search terms. So first, I might show a brief video which models the concept. Then I could ask a question like the one on the bottom left to reinforce the concept. Next, I could prompt students to practice the concept. Um, on the top right is the student view of a screen where I added a link to the slide in Pear Deck. So the projector view is in blue with the prompt that says identify keywords on the topic of bullying. On the right is the page that I linked to, which is a topic overview from the opposing viewpoints database. So in this exercise, students practice narrowing the broad topic of bullying based on the details um, that were found in the topic overview to develop um, an effective search. 
I then asked them to skim the topic overview and to identify possible keywords they would search in databases. Sorry about that. Um, and so on the next slide, I would then ask them to share these search terms, and then we would go over those together. Um, next slide. Okay, so here are some other examples of poll questions I might use. Here, students would be learning to identify um, a peer-reviewed article. First, I might show a brief video or give a brief explanation on the concept. Uh, then I would uh, have a slide which links to an article. They would be able to review the article. I could ask them if it's peer-reviewed or not and why they chose their answer. So it's interesting to see all the different things that students point out. And because it's anonymous, I can comment on it and explain why a response is making a good point. Um, or maybe make some clarifications on other responses. So students are learning from each other and they're getting immediate feedback. Next slide. After using Pear Deck, here are some things that I like about it. You can see how many students are logged into the presentation and how many have responded to each question. I know that I've used some other programs like Poll Everywhere, which I didn't think had that option. Um, in my experience, most students in the class did submit answers for each prompt, so I got to hear from most people. I, I like the process of reviewing responses anonymously to clarify misconceptions, and I like that it's a streamlined way to incorporate questions and activities into the presentation, so students don't need to go to an external poll in the middle. Um, they just join one time at the beginning of class, and everything can be linked in those slides. So for the future, I am interested in exploring the asynchronous presentation option. There's also an option called immersive reader that you can turn on which lets students hear the text aloud which can be helpful for language learning um, and lastly there are some options on the paid version uh, that look helpful like the different question types but also um, an option for session review to look at the responses after the class which would be useful for assessment and a live teacher dashboard which lets you make edits to the presentation in real time so that's it for my presentation thank you Hello everyone, I'm Christine Fina. I'm the undergraduate success librarian from Stony Brook University, and I am also the liaison to the writing program, which means I help a lot of undergraduate students with their research papers. So I'm gonna tell you about a workshop I began experimenting with back in fall 2021 through this presentation that I'm calling Same Topic, Different Sources, using an interactive virtual workshop for first-year students to ease research anxiety. So for some inspiration from the InfoLit literature, here are a couple quotes from articles that focus on a student's own curiosity as a really important driver of genuine engagement in the research process, pointing to the importance of personal connection, low stakes exploration, and self-reflective behaviors, all of which I try to work into this workshop I'm gonna tell you about. My goals with the workshop were to help students realize that even if they have absolutely no past experience with a research paper, they already bring a lot to the table with their own lived experiences and interests. I wanted to shift the mindset from thinking they need to follow a really formulaic linear path to this perfect research paper to realizing it's okay if they hit dead ends or supposed to hit dead ends. That's, that's part of the process. Um, and finally, ease anxiety by removing this idea that there's an idealized research process that they're supposed to live up to. So I called the workshop the research journey choose your own adventure, just to emphasize the idea of choice and, and pathways. I've done it twice in fall 2021, fall 2022. It's a 75 minute workshop. And a really important piece of information is why did they even show up? <laughs> this is not an instruction session. This is a workshop that they voluntarily sign up for. So part of Stony Brook's first year experience is there's an event attendance requirement, and you can actually get your event up on this curated list. Uh, it's created by the undergraduate colleges. And so they have to sign up for something. Uh, so they're choosing it and that they're choosing this event from other events. 
Uh, but there is this sort of requirement. So it's not like they're 100% excited about being there, um, but they are there. And as you can see, uh, there's great attendance. In 2021, I had 118 show up in the Zoom. And in 2022, I had 68. And almost all of them are first year undergraduates. Um, and so the goal that I give them at the beginning, it's on the bottom of the slide. I tell them in this workshop, you will practice exploring different types of sources on topics that interest you with the goal of developing confidence in your ability to navigate your own research journey. So this is the general outline. Most of the time is spent on the Padlet activity, which is what I'm gonna focus on in this presentation. That takes up a good 30 minutes of those 75 minutes. But I also, uh, I do lots of interactivity. And so there's this reflection on the research process. I use Poll Everywhere to just get their ideas about what do they like about doing research? What do they not like? So we do start with reflection. I tried to keep the database demo to a minimum. So I don't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I'll, I give them links, I do something really quick. I give them sort of a search strategies cheat sheet, but that's not the focus of the workshop. It's not on, this is how you're gonna do this. It's more, these are some resources we're gonna try out. Um, and then what I do is I shift it to a discussion of types of sources. Uh, we look at a source list from a peer reviewed journal article. We look at all the different types of sources and I use the Zoom chat to get students to volunteer you know, what are you going to find in a library database? When are you going to use library databases? When are you going to use the open web? Just to give them a sense of information landscape before we start the activity. Okay, so this is the activity. These are the directions. Because students are often told they can choose any topic they want and they still get stuck in this really formulaic way of thinking about research. I thought I would give them all the exact same starting place, so the exact same general topic area, and then show them how differently they're each going to approach that topic area depending on their interests. So the topic I choose is, is chocolate. I say we're all going to we're all going to research chocolate now, um, and they have to write down a specific thing that interests them about chocolate. They have to identify the academic disciplines or areas of expertise that are relevant to that specific area. And then they have to find two sources. One of them has to be from the library databases and the other one has to be from out on the open web. And then they're gonna share in their Padlet. So really important with this is the scaffolding. Uh, and I learned this after the first time I did it. I thought I created beautiful scaffolding, but it wasn't enough. <laughs> um, I always did this example post, but I really walked them through it. So I said, okay, so I'm gonna say I'm interested in the question, why do people crave chocolate? This idea of cravings. And then I, I, I asked them, I say, so what, you know, what areas of expertise might be relevant? And, you know, psychology, health sciences, nutritionists or dietitians. Um, and then I went out and we do a search and, uh, you know, this is the article that I, I showed them had a link to the Padlet. It's a peer reviewed journal called Appetite. And it's on how to use mindfulness to help decenter your chocolate <laughs> Um, And then the other one for the open web, I said, you know what, I want to find an NPR podcast. So I did a search uh, on NPR.org um, and found a, a Terry Gross podcast where she's interviewing a psychiatrist about dopamine. And I showed them exactly how to link it in the Padlet, exactly how to do everything, how to find those permalinks, so on and so forth. And then I let them go and be free. And so you can see, I just need to drag this down, that this is an example of one of the Padlets from the first time I did it. Lots of postings here. This is one from fall 2022. This is sort of what it looks like once they get going. The level of engagement is really interesting. So if you recall, there's no instructor present. This is not for a class. This is students who just showed up for not knowing what to expect. It's a big risk I'm taking. <laughs> but both semesters, exactly 26% of those present were really active and posted to the Padlet, which I was pretty happy with. Uh, I, I was worried I would get nobody. So um, you can see at the bottom here, out of all these posts, they more they were able to get more links to the databases. They sort of, I think, ran out of time 
for the open web sources, but all in all, 85 distinct sources were found by these 50 posts across both semesters, only two repeats uh, across both semesters. So a, a lot of diversity when it comes to the sources that they found. Uh, here are some examples out of the many, many topics they came up with, chocolate and mood, chocolate and slavery, chocolate and menstruation, how to sculpt chocolate, origins of chocolate, origins of the word chocolate, athletes, consumption of chocolate, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is a, a chart. So across those 50 posts, 22 different areas of expertise were uh, recognized by the students. It just really beautifully reflects the interests of the undergraduate student body at Stony Brook University. The general health sciences and psychology were the, uh, the, the largest areas, but we also, you know, there's a, a large business component, ethics. The, the sculpting person was even interested in physics and art, um, engineering, so on and so forth. So it, it really got them to think about different types of experts that are out there and how they can apply that uh, to their different angles on their topic. So they, they did really well with identifying diverse and interesting topics, identifying different disciplinary areas, using the library's discovery layer. Um, things that were tricky were I, I, um, I realized the first time I did it, I needed to do even more scaffolding to show them how to use the Padlet to make sure they got those hyperlinks in there. And uh, if they ended up in EBSCO, I really had to make sure then you had to get that permalink and weren't just grabbing the top URL. That was really important. And um, as we're doing this, you know, even the students who don't post are watching and listening and learning. And I'm talking while they're posting. And then at the end, I click on as many links as I can to show everyone what all the students came up with. So as they're posting, we're talking about database records, how to use database records, how to evaluate web sources, um, and ways to interact with different subject areas. Um, I had 35 students fill out the feedback form for both semesters, and I was really pretty happy with what they were saying. They learned how to tailor your research to you, um, how to find sources through multiple channels, how the searches can help you pick better and more interesting topics. They liked the interaction. My favorite is, thank you, it eased all of my anxiety about research, yay. <laughs> and uh, I had fun doing my own little digging. So overall, uh, it still has some bumps that I'm working out, but students seem to understand the importance of their unique perspectives, individual curiosities, variety of approaches, so on and so forth. And um, I think there was this goal of showcasing to the students the value of their unique experiences, approaches, and perspectives when they're doing research. Thank you. So thank you to all our lightning round presenters. That was fabulous. And I love the variety um, and just the different ideas that came up. So we would love to invite questions. There are already a few questions in the chat. Um, anyone can feel free to type a question. Um, we can also, we will be using progressive stacking. You can indicate with an asterisk if you identify from a non-dominant group. Um, but otherwise put your question in. Um, Harvey Long, who is a committee member of the um, virtual engagement committee will be moderating the Q&A. So I hand it over to Harvey. Thank you. Um, so I would like to lift up some of the questions that have already been answered. Um, so I think Jenny asked Stephanie, did you, did you limit students to using art books or did they look for books all over the library's collection? And you all can read the answer in the chat. Um, I think we had another question from Megan. Does your institution pay for Pear Deck? If not, is there a limit to the features that you have access to using this free version? So there was a lot of interest in Pear Deck and I'm not sure if maybe our presenter would like to unmute and give us more information about Pear Deck. Sure. Um, so what I demo today was mostly the free version because that's what I um, that's what I use. And um, in the beginning, they do give you um, a trial with the paid features, um, but I did not continue that. So today, mostly talked about um, the the free uh, the free access to that. 
Um, I see that there was another question about uh, Slido. So I have not personally used that. Um, I do know that Pear Deck has an emphasis on education. So it does have a lot of um, education-based templates like those assessments um, that I mentioned. I think it can be helpful to get some ideas when planning the lesson um, to, to get some ideas from the templates that they have when, when planning lessons compared to, it looks like Slido is not education-based, but I might be wrong about that. And you all also have lots of fans. Jennifer said, uh, such great ideas, totally stealing. And um, Amber is asking if you all would be willing to share your contact information. Do we have any more questions or comments? Okay, I think we have a comment from Brian, our first year student or seminar, I'm not sure what FYS stands for. Classes require students to attend an event as well. In addition to reach, did you link the workshop to other topics in the class? For example, our class is focused on the common read book. I think this one is for me, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, Bryant, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first year, yeah, the there usually is a common read. It, um, I didn't, I've done other workshops connected to the common read actually, but in this case, I'm sort of using that first year experience in with the event list to target more of the students who I know are gonna freak out when they're taking their intermediate, the required intermediate writing workshop. So it's more of a way um, to not tie in as much with the first year experience, which I do do in other workshops but to reach out to those students who might be nervous about um, as we, you know, about that research paper. As we all know, these students come into the university and a lot of faculty expect that they just know how to do research. I mean, maybe there's a small percentage who have taken something like AP seminar where they've done a lengthy research paper, but the vast majority have not. And so there's often this mismatch between the faculty expectations of what the students are able to do. And I was just trying to get at that sort of um, create some motivation um, instead of connect directly to the first year experience with this one. Uh, but that's a great point um, to link to the common read, uh, which I have done in the past. Thank you for the question. We have plenty of time for more questions. You all have them. So do you all use the Padlet several times throughout your instruction sessions for multiple reflection points, or do you generally use the Padlet for a final reflection at the end? Uh, I'll start, and then I, I'll share if my colleagues have anything else. Um, we've done both, <laughs> uh, but more commonly at the end. 
and I think once again, it's just the, the boundaries of time, um, trying to both provide time for reflection as well as, uh, you know, content. Uh, the tour example was one where the whiteboards, um, I do those more often, multiple times throughout, um, but I'll, I'll be quiet in case Abby and Sarah have anything to add to that. I think that was generally what I was going to say. What's nice is you could even probably build it in as a break in the middle of a session, you know, depending on how your sessions are structured and how much time you have. There's a lot of different ways you can incorporate this. So. Thank you. And then we have another question about our first year students. Uh, this person is finding that first year students don't reach out unless it's something they are graded on. Is that your experience as well? I think that is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Um, yes and no. And, and it, that's sort of why I, I thought I'd try this workshop because I was trying to reach out to them because again, they, they do show up to these workshops and because uh, they have to, they have to, to choose one. And so that's why I was thrilled that I got 26% actually engaging. <laughs> this is a lot of work I gave them. Um, but what they, what they do have to do for these, just so you know, is I don't have to, I have no connection with their first year seminar instructor what, whatsoever. So they're showing up and it's all on them. They go to the event and they write a reflection and then they turn in the reflection. So they go and they pay attention and they, they write up like a one to two page reflection on the event they attended. In general, yes, I would agree that there, there's, there needs to be some sort of impetus to get the students to um, tune in to library help. I don't know. I mean, at our institution, we unfortunately do not have any kind of required library orientation as part of orientation uh, or as part of that first year seminar. So this is our way of trying to get in front of as many first year students as possible. This is one thing we have control over, creating experiences for them to maybe choose in their event attendance requirement for that first semester. Um, so yeah, I agree that they, they're not necessarily going to reach out unless there's something baked in to their curriculum in some way. I hope that answers your question, Julian. Great. All right, and you have another question, uh, Christine. Uh, do you look through the Padlet responses together with the students at the end of the workshop, or what do you emphasize in your final wrap up? I absolutely look through. I mean, that's so, so yeah, I, I went through this very quickly. I give them five to seven minutes really of just work time. Uh, but the whole activity takes about 30 minutes. So I might talk a little bit, but, but mostly I do give them some actual work time to go out. So they're not feeling rushed. And then I spend a lot of time. I click on the links and the Padlet. And as we talked about, this is all anonymous. So no one's being singled out or anything. And so if I click on a link and it turns out it was a link that didn't work because maybe they took that top URL bar from an EBSCO, it's, it's a learning opportunity. Uh, and so, so I go through as many as I can, again, because the whole point of the workshop is to showcase their own unique voices. Look at all these different things you found, all these different types of sources, and they're using different library databases. They're not necessarily using the same ones. And uh, in the, for the open web environment, we talk about the difference between using a search engine or going to a particular website, a company website, or, you know, like NPR org is, is what I demoed. So it takes a long time to not only for them to, to do the activity, but then to process it and then tie it all up at the end. So um, I hope that answers your question. It looks like Amber had one as well. Did I skip? Um, do you get to see the reflections they write about your workshop to get? That is such a great question. We would love to see that. I'd love to see those. I think you mean the reflections that they turn in to their first year seminars. Not not systematically, no. I mean, we we anecdotally hear from some of the first year seminar instructors that we have connections with, which workshops they respond well to. And we have talked about some way to try to 
see those more systematically so we can get really great feedback that way instead of just our little feedback form. But uh, yeah, it's a, it would be a great thing if we could see uh, to build up that connection. I love that idea. Thanks Thank for that you question. for catching that. I did not see that question. Um, maybe we have time for one more. Before I turn it back over to Erin uh, to offer some remarks before we leave. Maybe not. <laughs> this concludes the, the Q&A portion. Thank you so much. This was fabulous. Um, so we will be sending out a recording and we'll be sharing that recording with anyone who signed up for the recording as well. Um, we just a reminder, you can feel free to check out the tiny URL that has additional information and resources from each of the presenters. We will be adding the slide link there as well. So you can have access to the slides. Um, we want to just give us a big thank you to all our presenters. Thank you um, to Stephanie Hillis, Sarah Hagerman, Cynthia Keller, Abby Lewis, Megan Marchese, and Christine Fina for a fabulous session for all your work and for sharing such great ideas. I'm excited to implement some. Um, it just gave me a lot to think about. We also just wanna thank Aaliyah Price um, and Aloha Sharp at ACRL for helping to organize the session. Um, I would like to thank all the virtual engagement committee members for making the session run so smoothly, for Harvey for uh, moderating the Q&A. Um, and just thank you for all who attended. Thanks for joining the session. Thank you for your interest. Um, and thank you for your questions. Um, so have a wonderful rest of your week and take care, everyone. Thank you.